Hi there, this is Andre and you are on the Marketing Innovation Podcast Show. Our special guest today is Oliver Fickins, the founder of Trusted Search Marketing and Track5, an online technology company that builds and manages intuitive web flat platforms where employers and talent meet. Today, we'll discuss marketing strategies and tactics for scaling tech startups in 2022 and beyond. So without further ado, Oliver, it's a pleasure to, hear, to have you here on the show. How are you? How's your morning going? Because you are logging <laughs> in from America, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, uh, my morning's just getting started and your day is just about to end, right? So yes, <laughs> that's really great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. A pleasure, a pleasure. Really looking forward to discussing today. Uh, I think it's going to be a very dynamic and interesting discussion. Uh, it's always nice to share thoughts with a fellow entrepreneur. Uh, you have even more experience because you founded more businesses uh, during the past almost 20-ish years, right? Yeah, 20 years. I, I started my first business when I was 14 years old. So, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's talk a bit about that one, maybe as a yeah. as a warm up, <laughs> as a, an appetizer, right? So, yeah. So, um, you know, first off, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. Um, well, mainly my father, right? So, uh, I'm actually, as I was telling you before the show, I'm, I was actually born in England, in Southampton, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, grew up in London and Southampton. And my father uh, was in the Royal Navy, but he turned into an entrepreneur um, while he was in the Navy. Uh, opened up a catering company while he was stationed, uh, you know, in, in the UK. And then he was stationed in Portugal and he, he opened up another catering company. He ended up selling it, uh, making some money while he was enlisted, left the military and parlayed that, that money into other, other startups. So I got to watch the entrepreneurial process over and over and over again. My father wasn't somebody that really liked to manage companies. He was the entrepreneur's entrepreneur. He liked to, to get in, scale a company and exit which is what mm -hmm. a lot of entrepreneurs like to do. Um, and, and by the way, for, for your entrepreneurial audience, like that's an important skill to recognize, right? Like if there's a difference between starting a company and managing a company, they are not the same thing. Those two job descriptions and responsibilities are not interchangeable. They're mm -hmm. two different things, right? So you have to be able to reskill uh, and refocus for both of those things. But anyway, seeing my father, father do it and, and work tirelessly and work really hard, I was able to, to kind of get in and do a similar thing. So at 14 years old, um, I, was, I was a DJ. <laughs> I like kids' birthday parties and stuff like that, you know? And I worked for a company at 14 and they went out of business and they were selling, uh, they had like 17 different, uh, you know, vehicles and, and DJ equipment sets. And they were like, they just wanted to get rid of it. So for like 3,000 US dollars, they were selling a van, <laughs> all the music and all the DJ equipment, some lights, everything you would need to get started, including the vehicle for $3,000. It was a great deal. Nice. Yeah. So I basically wrote a business plan to my dad and said, look, I mean, my friend would like to do this. His dad's going to put in $1,500. I want you to put in $1,500 and here's how we're going to make this successful. So at 14, you know, I couldn't even drive the vehicle. And, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I started working on on that, right? And, and, and grew up once I hit 16, you know, really scaled it up. I remember coming home from, from school and going to my dad's office. And one of our biggest markets was school dances. So looking to, to get to school. So, you know, I had to go sell this. So I would literally spend all night on the internet, like basically copying all the fax numbers, because this was 20 years ago, all the fax yeah, yeah. numbers of all the high schools and schools all across Pennsylvania. And I would like thousands of fax numbers and I would make a flyer and I would literally one by one stay till 11 o'clock at night at my dad's office, faxing these to, you know, attention school dance manager, you know, and then sending the flyer. And, and you know, all day long, I was hustling at 14, 15, 16. And I would get like one or two contracts for, you know, the year's worth of school dances from each one of these schools that came through. And I rode that business all through, through school, through college. Um, and it really taught me how to grind and hustle. You know, not, you know my, my father gave me a really good piece of advice. Um, he's a consummate salesperson. So he, he used to tell me, nothing happens to you sell something. And I live those words to this day. And I've seen so many entrepreneurs silo themselves into specific things, whether it be, we have to have the best product. We have to have the biggest sales. We have to do this, this, this. And a big mistake of entrepreneurs is not really looking at this as a holistic you know, combination of things that have to execute at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that gave me that sense of hustle. It, it showed me kind of how to set this up. And, uh, you know, I went to go work for some, some tech companies, some large tech companies. And then when I was about 21 years old, um, you know, I didn't even finish college or finish college. And I dropped out of college to work and I ended up starting my own company 
scaling that company pretty well, going back and finishing college, you know, and then, uh, you know, scaling other companies up as well. So it, I've been, I, I don't really know what it's like to work in my adult life for a company. I've always been an entrepreneur. So I don't think I could have it any other way. That's fun. And also a lot of, uh, as you're saying, grind and hustle. Um, yeah. But I guess uh, dur during your high school, you were probably a bit of a rock star with the <laughs> music business, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's funny, right? Like, you know, and, and it's fun, but I always tell people like, you know, I've coached a couple people through the entrepreneurial process and, you know, sometimes I just, I, A, I think people give up too easy and B, I think that people underestimate the amount of time and, and sacrifice it takes to launch a successful business. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't going to parties. I was DJing them, right. And getting paid. I wasn't going and hanging out with friends. I was sitting at my dad's office, sending faxes, you know, when I mm -hmm. launched my other companies, you know, I was coming home and, and, you know, at 11 o'clock at night because I was, you know, working and growing my business. Like, cause I not only did I have to manage the clients and, and create the product, but I also had to sell, I had to do the bookkeeping, I had to do everything. So, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of sacrifice when you're at that level, and it's, it sounds like a lot of your entrepreneurs are, are solo operators or kind of just getting started. So, I mean, that should resonate. But my advice to your, your listeners would be to really, you know, it is a lot of work and the sacrifices are huge. Everybody wants to see the money and the nice cars and everything that comes when you become successful. But there's never a glimpse into what you sacrificed or how much work it took to get there, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a nice saying I remember I saw it uh, it was probably a meme but uh, it, st uh, it stayed with me it was something like uh, the value of anything is the amount of time you put into it and I think this applies very much to to starting a business no for sure absolutely and, and also growing it obviously because <laughs> it's not just going to pick up like this so what was your next move after you um well, you went through college and you dropped out and what did you do? Yeah. So I basically, I was working for an internet company that uh, basically, um, uh, you know, it was a very early, it was kind of like very early social media, social networking, kind of like MySpace or Facebook. But instead of one platform, the concept behind this tech company was to create a, uh, a scalable platform in a specific vertical or niche or location, and then create the platform to be able to duplicate these very quickly, almost with a push of a button and give access to people. So, um, you know, if you wanted to come and make a marketing social network, you could, you could launch an account, launch a social network and you could populate it, run it. It would be completely free. Um, but then this, uh, this company was able to run advertising throughout the entire platform of social network sites. And then they could target it based on demographic. You know, if, mm -hmm. um, you know, if they had a golf company that's selling golf clubs, for example, if there was a social network targeting older people or, uh, you know, high end kind of interests or hobbies, they could just run it through that. So the company was, uh, was funded with a couple million dollars. We went through that process It ended up not surviving. It didn't do well. But during that time, I, I met another fellow marketing friend of mine who was, uh, he had a side hustle, <laughs> a little bit of a, a side business. And he was basically an SEO. He did internet marketing uh, like me. And basically what he did was he was recruiting nurses through a, a little website. Basically, it was nothing more than a page or two and a form. And, it, and this is early internet, you know, 20 years ago. He was getting nurses that were applying and setting up resumes and, you know, for, for travel nurse positions, you know, transit, transit positions. And he was basically working with one nurse staffing agency and saying, look, I'll send you my resumes. If you hire one of these nurses or place them at a hospital, send me a thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, so anyway, he was running this for about eight months and he was sending hundreds of candidates to this, this company. And, you know, he was coming to me saying they haven't placed a single nurse. My, my candidates must be horrible. My marketing sucks. You know, what am I going to do? And, you know, I said, man, I think you've got this all wrong. And I don't know how you could scale this. I think I could turn this into a million dollar business. So he said, really, well, let's partner. So we ended up partnering together on it. I completely changed the model from a performance model to a SaaS model, subscription as a service or software as a service where people mm -hmm. are paying monthly. And I basically called that one client and said, we're going to stop the candidates coming through because obviously they, they don't work. You haven't placed anybody in a year. Uh, and we're going to sell this to your competitors now. Well, I got a call back in five minutes from the CEO of that company saying, oh, there was an accounting error. We placed 25 people in the last six months. Here's uh, exactly $25,000. Right. And then they, and then I said, great, thanks for $25,000. Now you have to pay a subscription fee like everybody else, which they did. Mm -hmm. So we ended up growing that to about a million and a half, $2 million business. 
Um, it still exists in our portfolio under Track 5 today, which really Track 5, my company, is really just a portfolio company. We run multiple uh, online uh, platforms that, that are basically career sites or job boards uh, mm -hmm. for different professions. And that's, that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. And we maintain, sell, and, and we, we market them as products and sell, them, sell access to them to, to the companies that need the talent. So we basically... Just a little um, question here, so we yeah. uh, so it's clear for everybody. So basically, you guys are developing the platforms that are then sold to companies and uh, rebranded or branded as a, according to the company. No, and... so so we build the platform as a business, and then we operate the business. So one arm of our site is is making the product, but then we're op we're running them as a, so a so software as a service. So we're you know we make the job board for example, and then half of our company will go and sell it to. For example, we have a really large job board in the transportation space, the truck driving space. Uh, in mm -hmm. America, truck driving is a massive demand right now. Very, very big demand. Mm -hmm. UK so, as well. You know, yeah, yeah. So we have companies that will you know, subscribe to access to our platform to post their jobs, go into a resume database, get candidates applying to them. And they'll pay thousands of dollars per month each one to become part of this platform and, and receive you know, hundreds of qualified candidates. So you know, not only do we build the software and, and iterate the software and make the software better and grow it, but we also have to run the business side of it, which is the pricing, selling, taking care of the clients, the marketing for both the users and the clients who we sell to, um, and all the HR and legal, you know, stuff that goes in around that as well. So we're okay. constantly launching, like we're basically a little startup company. All we do is launch little startups and we run them. Um, and they're, they're each one of them does, you know, million, million, $2 million each a year. So cumulatively together, they do, you know, a decent amount of revenue for us. And then we, have a team which is dedicated to each one of these platforms and we will grow these platforms and, and, and staff them and, and change them as we need to, to, to keep revenue coming in. Very cool. So you basically built a model that works and then just repli replicate it across uh, industries. <laughs> yeah. So we built the platform and we basically, you know, and we've tied, you know, each platform is geared toward a specific profession, nursing, mm -hmm. doctors, truck drivers, pilots, things like that. But the core framework of our, our proprietary software, we can duplicate or replicate, and we just have to change the way it looks, the, what, you know, the words on the site, the database schemas for you know, their, how the different types of jobs relate to each other. But it's, it's a push of a button. It's very quick. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, making the site is easy. Uh, scaling it and bringing on the clients and the marketing and the, and the, the candidates, that's what takes a lot of time and money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, interesting, and I, I'm happy that we uh, clarified this so people know, you, you know, what you are doing at the moment uh, with Drag Five. Now let's go back to the story. So you were saying about uh, the way that you sort of <laughs> started out. Yeah. So you know, we basically, you know, I started with this one, this one gentleman, a good friend of mine, and we started with one in nursing and. You know, we started it, I joined, we joined together in 2007. So we basically switched the model and it was crazy. I was 21 years old. I had no money. I was just, just getting, I hadn't finished college, right? But I had an idea, I had a vision and I knew that I could sell it. I knew I could market it. I knew we could get it where it needed to go. So we started launching it. We started getting really successful. And then 2008, the next year happened. And I don't know if it was the same way in the UK, but in 2008, we had the worst financial crisis in the United States that we've had in decades. Hey, everybody, know? I think. <laughs> yeah. So the whole world just, just got poor, <laughs> like for a couple of years, right? And, when they, and the recruiting is cyclical. So when, when the economy goes down um, and companies start laying off, they're certainly not hiring. <laughs> so their need for job boards and recruitment services that we offer go down. So we, you know, mm -hmm. I remember losing half the business that I just spent every waking hour of my life building, <laughs> like literally in, in two months, you know, and we had to go through some really hard times. You know, we weren't getting paid. We were working double the amount of time. I remember calling clients and begging them saying, look, stay, you know, we'll lower the price, stay on here. We're going to do double the work for you. But we need, you know, we, I needed to secure cash flow to keep the business going. Um, you know, we were, we had to get really good and really efficient at internet marketing, which is where we kind of started in this, you know, about 20 years ago. And, you know, to get those costs down, we had to really take care of our clients to get them the results. So they did stay during a downtime. And, you know, basically we were able to grow that back up, um, and add more job boards and add more revenue. Now we're about a, you know, six, seven, $8 million company. So, you know, we, you know, we're, we were able to kind of grow out of that and keep, keep pushing, but it would have been really easy for me to, to fold it up and, and go do something else or go get a job. And it would have been way less stressful. 
But, Mm -hmm. you know, like I was saying earlier, that hustle, that grit, that grind, and also just knowing yourself and knowing what you can do and knowing your market, that convinced me to kind of put in that extra effort, stay focused, and it paid off. Mm -hmm. Super, super. Okay, so how were the last years for you? Uh, Because obviously, uh, well, I don't know if we are heading towards a similar scenario as uh, 2008 or not. Um, It looks like it by (laughs) some (laughs) some indicators. Um, Yeah, so it's it's weird, right? Because you're right, like inflation, I don't know how it is over there, but the US has rapid inflation right now, like 30, Mm -hmm. it's just, I don't, I've never seen it like this in my lifetime. And, you know, um, you're seeing it everywhere, the gas, um, you know, big problem. Bacon is like double the price. You know, that's like, that's what I use as an index. What? Is it double? It's like like $10. (laughs) It's like 10 or $11 now to get a a little thing of bacon. It used to be like four or five, $6. So gas is expensive. Yeah. Everything's expensive. So it's, it's hitting our labor market. So it's making labor more expensive, which is good in America because, you know, people get paid more, but it doesn't equal out to the inflation the inflation is still more. And what Mm -hmm. we're seeing now is that because people are so desperate for, so basically America was asleep for the last year with COVID, right? Everybody was locked down in their homes. Companies went under, you couldn't even go to a restaurant. You wouldn't stay in a hotel. Like certain, you know, cruises were all parked, you know, Disney world was shut down. Like everything was shut down. And now with the vaccines coming out and with, you know, just in general, America is sprung open. And everybody got a lot of stimulus money throughout the, you know, they got a, you know, a couple thousand dollars from the government. Some uh, also businesses here got to take advantage of what's called a PPP loan, which was mm-hmm. basically the government came out and said, you know, if you're suffering from COVID, we're going to inject, you know, X amount of money into you. And companies got millions of dollars from government. Um, the companies got hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you could show that you were, you know, if you kept employees on and did not let them go, you got to keep the money. It was meant to be a loan, but you ended up keeping it. And then even better than that, they were going to tax you on it, tax it as revenue. And then they forgave the tax as well. So it was completely free money. So you have all these, you know, business owners that were that, you know, yes, they suffered, but they were also given some help. And the whole economy has just been saving money for a year, not going out to eat, not going on vacations. So once the, we'll say America opened back up and people were allowed out of their houses and vaccines were available, America went on a sheer spending spree like Mm -hmm. we've never seen before. And the rest of the world hasn't really caught up, you know, like the factories in China are still dealing with it. They're backlogged, you know, everything shut down. You can't just turn on the global economy really quickly. So you know, what that's helped for us for is that, you know, people are hiring and they're hiring all the people that they let go. And on top of that, because there's extra demand, people, you know, we grew 20%, you know, through COVID, um, you know, right after once we opened up, we grew like a rocket ship and we've been really nice. trying to keep up with all the demand. So it's been really good for us, but it's been challenged. It's been good from a demand perspective, but it's been difficult because of the challenges related to trying to find people to work the increased costs and every cost has gone up for us, but thank God the demand has gone up as well. So it's, mm-hmm. it's just a very challenging and crazy environment to work in. I've never seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's this the will... same over there. Yeah, yeah. And Europe as well. Like uh, I'm not very uh, aware of the situation in China and uh, the sort of uh, Asian countries, but um, here as well. I mean, uh, I guess it has to do a lot with the, um, increasing uh, uh, gas price and everything that has to do with the energy sector. Uh, but as you said, people probably have saved a lot. Uh, certainly a lot of businesses have gone bankrupt during this time. And now since things have started to open a bit during the summer, now they are sort of <laughs> going back into a little sort of lockdown. Uh, yeah. But I guess um, everybody should be a bit cautious in terms of how they direct their uh first of all how they save up money for what's coming because we don't really know and right. then uh, uh of course um, just to spend money more cautiously and uh, i have a question this doesn't really have to do with our subject but since we are at it sure uh how, uh, how do you see you know from uh, from you guys from america how are things looking uh, economically do you have any prediction or are you taking certain measures to ensure that you'll do well uh, in a scenario, if you have a scenario, even better, like the one that you believe will happen. I think that would be interesting for for us because I guess many of our listeners are a bit like us in the way that they have their hands deep into the business world. Yeah. 
Well, like it's interesting, right? Like the top 1%, the, the, especially like the business owners and things like that received a lot of capital from the US government during COVID. So the people that have the most disposable income at this point have a ton of extra money to burn. And especially, you know, right now with business going so crazy um, and the stock market going so crazy in the US, um, you know, the big earners have a lot of extra cash. Unfortunately, you know, people on the, on the lower rungs that don't necessarily have that disposable income, they're, they're getting the brunt of it, right? Because the inflation's here, they're, they're spending more, there is wage increase, but it just doesn't match. So, you know, but, but we are seeing the, the demand is just so huge right now in the US and it's going to take years to go through this demand. They, they can't even sell cars right now because they can't get parts. There's a waiting list for just about everything. Um, it's, it's, there's so much pent up demand you know, from the, the consumers in this country that everything is going really, really well if you own a business. <laughs> but if you're trying to put food on the table, unfortunately, it's a little, little bit tougher. Um, but for us, I mean, really with, with the entrance of COVID and the variants, and I feel like it's musical chairs, like COVID just goes around the world that comes back again, you know, like we'll, we'll do really, really good. And then you hear Germany is like, oh, Germany is doing really good, right? Then now they're, they're having it again, or India is doing good. And then they go, you know, horrible or Italy or, or England or Buenos Aires, Argentina, wherever, right? Like COVID just kind of goes around the world, but it always comes back. So we're always kind of going in these little curves where it comes down and we let our guard down. And then four months later, we have a humongous big spike. And, you know, what that does for, as a business owner, I think is make it very difficult to forward plan. Planning mm -hmm. is almost impossible long-term because you can't account for things like government shutting down. You can't account for, um, you know, inflation that's just moving around. You can't account for your office being shut down because of COVID infections and things like that. I mean, you, you can at some point, but you can't really put pen to paper and say what your business is going to be doing in two years from now. The market is just too unstable. So, you know, for us, there's a lot of short-term planning and really working on being agile, being able to move quickly to opportunities, avoid threats. But a lot of it too is making sure that we have a lot more money in the bank <laughs> than mm -hmm. we, we ever did before because we want to be able to weather the storm a little bit easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, good moves. Um, I'm, I'm with you here. And that's also why we, we started our trusted search marketing brand. You know, we do, did, we do, we've done digital marketing for, you know, 15 years here at track five. We're very good at it. I mean, insanely good at it. Um, you know, we spend millions of dollars and with Google, we, we've been running these campaigns and SEO and everything forever. And, um, you know, I actually used to own, um, in 2010, I actually started a, another digital agency. Uh, we grew that up to a two, $3 million agency and, uh, and I sold it off. Um, but we worked with some massive international clients doing SEO and digital marketing. So, you know, for me, it's a pedigree and for any company I touch is usually very marketing centric. Mm -hmm. But for us, the reason we, we opened up this division of our, our holding company called Trusted Search Marketing, which is a digital marketing agency, is because we were so pigeonholed in recruiting. When COVID hit, we lost, you know, 20% of our revenue because nobody was hiring. But I can tell you what went really what went 20% the other way is digital marketing because all the mm -hmm. brick and mortar, all the local store shops and things like that, everybody went online and they needed SEO. They needed internet marketing. So for us strategically, you know, it allows us to balance, uh, you know, the recruiting market with a non recruiting market so that when one's going down, one's one stays positive or it mm -hmm. gives us a little bit of a, ba a backup a reserve. So that's kind of why we did it, but we're also really good at it. The agency just got a credit, a credential by Google, We're a Google partner agency. We've won some awards already. And, you know, we're, you know, we just have a different take on it. So we've been working with some clients in e-commerce, but surprisingly, because we have such a background in recruiting, uh, we have a lot of recruiting companies that are coming to us, you know, truck driving companies, healthcare companies asking us to do digital for recruiting talent, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's been interesting. It's not how we thought it was going to go. Uh, we thought we were going to be doing e-commerce and working with businesses. And that's what we thought was going to be, You know, that's what we wanted it to be. But as soon as we took our expertise in, in recruiting and opened up a, a digital agency, all the people that use us and know us in the recruiting space came over and said, can you do digital for us and should teach us how to do it? So oh, it's, cool. it, it's kind of like the market has told us what it wants from us. And although mm -hmm. we could do both, we're going to follow what the market, you know, the, where the demand is. Yeah, yeah sure. But yeah, it worked out well. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, so now since we came back to the marketing subject, um, let's see how you guys are planning your current marketing. And given the sort of shaky environment, um, how are you guys? How are you guys looking at um, 
let's say the small startups that you are running, I, I don't know if it's fair to call them that, but let's say yeah. you are uh, you are launching a new uh, platform and it's from sure. scratch. It, it's a technology pl- product. And what I think would be interesting to do is try to draw up some points where that would be applicable for virtually most of the tech startups out there. So if sure. you were to think, to think through your experience right now of launching a new tech startup, whether that's a SaaS or not, let's say it's a SaaS, but not necessarily limited to it. Yeah. Uh, what would be the approach that you'd have, or maybe you already do, um, to putting it, out, putting it out on the market now in the end of 2021, beginning of 2022? Yeah, so some really interesting things have happened in marketing in the marketing world, so to speak, in the last year or two. Um, you know, we've seen obviously influencer marketing, content marketing really become its own thing. It was mm-hmm. kind of lumped into, you know, SEO or lumped into just general marketing or PR, but now content marketing and influencer marketing have really matured and broken out into their own segments. So that's a really fun space. And now oftentimes, you know, we see, oh, we want to do social media advertising. We need content. Now we time, kind of look at it backwards where we have a content marketing strategy and it's going to be fueled and promoted by, by social media, right? So mm-hmm. we use social as an arm to promote the content that we're promoting. So, mm-hmm. you know, getting into things like video, it's really huge. We're seeing some great results with some video marketing that we're doing, uh, influencer mm-hmm. marketing, things like that. But for a tech company, it depends if you're a business to consumer or a business to business company. If you're, if you're selling to businesses, there's a little bit different market. So if you're doing that, what we call account-based marketing or ABM, where we're really working and producing content for that business. So becoming an mm-hmm. industry leader in that business and having that content tie into the solution that we have. So, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a product, a tech product in the finance space or the payroll space, for example, you may be producing content all around uh, the payroll industry and niche and coming to, to the market with really breathtaking statistics or perspective that, that really position you as the already, the, uh, the uh, expert for that, that industry, but you're mm-hmm. using social, whether it be LinkedIn um, or it just even generally some of the so general generic social platforms to really promote that. But some of the things that have really been interesting as well is we do a lot of paid ads. So a lot of media buying, whether it be Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, you know, um, we're in all these. And what we've seen over the last year has been really interesting to this because <clears throat> Facebook well, and Google pretty much, well, they came out, Apple came out with that whole iOS update about seven months ago where mm-hmm. you had to opt into privacy, right? And that's been a, I think a global trend, <laughs> like everybody wants more privacy, right? Um, it, it basically made it really difficult to place tracking cookies and use pixels to, to track remarketing and things like that. So across the entire world, um, everyone's pay-per-click marketing campaigns became worse, <laughs> mm-hmm. like overnight, because the, one of the reasons these mediums work so well is because, you know, if I want to find, if I'm selling houses and I want to find what we call an in-market audience, somebody that's yep. looking for a house, I can identify that on, on YouTube, for example. I can identify that person on Facebook. Well, now, because the tracking is gone, they're less likely to be able to be as accurate or B, um, if I want to build a remarketing audience, so people coming to my website and remarket to them, um, you know, not only can I not cookie them anymore, uh, if they're on a mobile phone or an Apple phone specifically, uh, they can also opt out retroactively. So they can opt out and be removed from an audience that they were already in. So mm-hmm. we had a, an e-commerce client that was selling um, uh, uh, tanning products, for example, a, a decent you know, e-commerce product and decent commerce client. We were, for example, we were using what's called remarketing, right? So we were uh, you know, doing Facebook ads, Google ads, things like that. And we were killing it on Facebook. We were selling this at a five to 10 X, you know, on, on this product, every, you know, every dollar they spent, they were making $10 in revenue off their product. Uh, and, and remarketing for us, for them worked really, really well. Well, as soon as this iOS update happened and all of a sudden their remarketing audience group started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the cost for sale ended up going from like a 10 X to an eight X to a three X to a two X. And right before our very eyes, you know, mm-hmm. it, it happened immediately. Um, some of our brands that track five, our, co- you know, our cost per client acquisition doubled uh, because of this, because the targeting wasn't as, as good and the reporting isn't as good. The attribution isn't as good. Mm-hmm. So what is, you know, so a lot of people went out of business. A lot of people cried and moaned and they're really upset and it is upsetting. It's very frustrating, mm-hmm. but what are your options, right? You can go with it <laughs> and you can try to find a way around it or you can admit defeat. 
So we decided to go with it. So we came up with a bunch of ideas. We tested a bunch of ideas. Not only were we able to bring those back in line, those costs back in line, but we were able to make them even better than before. Mm -hmm. So I think what it's, when challenges like this arise in marketing and changes in the global landscape for marketing, I think it really gives marketing people an opportunity to, to, to dust off those skills and to, to solve the problem. And I think that's very, a very entrepreneurial way to look at it. You know, it's like, you know, for me, whether it's a marketing issue or a business issue, it's, you know, I'm a fireman. All I do is put out fires, right? So like, I have to find a way to win because I'm not going to, I'm not going to quit. So it's American yeah. spirit right there. <laughs> on this note, on this note, but you probably have found it as well, just uh, worth mentioning. Uh, for example, what we found uh, as a fix to the issue that occurred then was using a lot of the lookalike audiences and creating custom audiences and then creating lookalike on specific custom audiences. Yeah. We, we are still doing it and it seems to be working very well. Yeah, we we did that. And we also used the Facebook API, you know, we switched to the mm-hmm. API that, so that we could do that as well. Um, the difference for us in niche products where it was a little bit harder to get that look like audience, once you go down lower in the niche, um, mm-hmm. once you were a little bit broader and there was a little bit more multifaceted to the target market, then it was, it was okay. But once we got super niche, um, it, you know, and super small in, in the targeting, it just became not as effective. Um, you know, we also found some inter- interesting things too. Um, for example, testing different ad creatives like video and image ads and carousel ads and, we would notice that when we swapped the image, the impressions would throttle, right? So like when we went from image to video, for example, the impressions would throttle and the, co- the cost per click or the cost per lead or acquisition cost would skyrocket as well. So we were mm-hmm. also able to test the distribution network of like Facebook and Instagram, for example, to find out what creatives actually produce because they don't show up in the same places and they're not promoted yep. with the same force, right? So. We did a bunch of testing to find out what the combination of, of you know, we, like I said, we tried to look like audiences and things like that. Um, and for our niches, they, they didn't, they did better, but they still didn't get us to where we were. Um, we ended up doing some things with video and some creative things work. And, and also it helps you be a better marketer because we took it all the way up the funnel, right? So we started, we started looking at our landing pages. Like we started, you know, swapping up our ads, working on day parsing and just getting all the fundamental things in marketing that sometimes we overlook for the shiny objects like retargeting or, you know, look like audiences or, or, you know, programmatic, right? Like, you know, sometimes we're so focused as marketers on that type of stuff. We forget that our landing page hasn't been freshened up for a year and it's not, and the conversion rate has been failing or the Mm -hmm. fact that we could be doing testing. And, you know, we just did a landing page change, um, you know, during this process as well. And we're able to get about a 20% increase in conversion rate you know, just from a new landing page. So that's without even touching the campaign. So mm-hmm. we tie these things all together. We're able to really bring that cost down. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been difficult. It's, but it's been good. I mean, like I said, it's forced us to, to, we were, not that we were lazy marketers before, but I think Facebook made it really easy. And now I think it got a little bit harder. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. But it, as, you, as you said, it's not necessary for, for the words because again, I think, uh, you know, you are running a marketing agency. We are a marketing agency. So here, uh, I, I think it helps out filter out the good agencies from not, I wouldn't say the bad agencies, but the, the agencies yeah. that shouldn't get that title yet. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And like, you know, and, and even like, even with that, right? Like we've had issues where uh, we're, we're just really weird issues where we've been like, no matter what we do, we can't fix it. We're like, man, we must really suck. Like we can't, we can't, like, why is this not, like in theory, what we're doing should work. So we end up, you know, a good example. We actually reached out to Facebook with our rep. We're like, hey, like, what are we doing wrong here? Like, we can't figure this out. And next thing you know, we get a call from a Facebook engineer. It's the only time in my life Facebook has ever called us <laughs> or anybody that I know. It's usually like a live chat or an email, but to get a phone call from a Facebook engineer, you know, something's wrong. So they basically said, yeah, it's, you know, you guys were right. It was a bug on the platform. We're going to address it. Like, so we're like catching bugs on Facebook. It sounds like, you know, Facebook's notorious for having bugs and breaking all the time. Um, and right now their attribution tracking and their reporting is garbage. Like the, they keep stripping away all these different types of reporting and they keep making it smaller and smaller and putting in disclaimers that it may not be accurate. And the, you know, the, the 28 day attribution is, you know, it's just, it's like, it's crazy. So it's, you know, like I said earlier, it's, 
it, it has made it more challenging. But like you said, the good agencies adapt. The bad agencies probably don't even know what's... The bad agencies don't even know that iOS came up with an update that has changed things. But, you know, <laughs> they, they're still wondering why their costs... You know, they're calling it seasonality. But, uh, you know, it's... But like, you know, it's the same thing with <laughs> SEO, right? Like <laughs> SEO is, is, is difficult as well. You know, it's just, you know, Google coming out with updates. So it's just, um, it's just interesting. The, I, I, but you know what? I say this now, Andre, but like the, it's always been like this, right? If it wasn't this, now this is a big one. Like the face of the iOS change, that's a big, that's a big change. I can't recall a larger change to paid advertising than that in my life. Yeah, I need to die. Or the negative. It's, it's mm-hmm. a big one. Um, in SEO, we have them all the time. We've been, they've been better at it recently, but if you go back in time to like Penguin, Panda updates, Farmer updates, you know, Mobile Geddon, different specific updates, um, that were very, very restrictive that put people out of business, penalty related updates, spam related updates. Like this is how it's been in digital marketing since I remember. And it's, that's a really tough pill to swallow if you're a business owner, right? So if I'm selling you and saying, we're going to do absolutely everything right, we're going to check the box, we're going to execute at the highest level, we're going to be your A team in marketing. But then Google can come in and make an algorithm change and wipe out all our gains temporarily. Or Apple can come out with a Facebook issue and change your cost per lead and and take away all the work we've done for the last three years of grooming your account, you know? Mm -hmm. Or your history is going to go away or your reporting is going to have to wait an extra week now because we need attribution to settle in and get you the right numbers. Like if you're a business owner, you're probably thinking, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so, yeah. but, that, but that's what it is. We've had to be really good with our clients and just be honest and say, this is what's happening. It's not your fault. It's not our fault. Um, and it's not even Facebook's fault or Apple's fault, but it's just, this is digital marketing. And, and it's, you know, it never stops and it always changes. And you just have to continually invest in, 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 a, in an operational sense. You have to keep going with it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you guys seeing that with your clients too, where it's just, you know, people could say like, you know, why is this different? You know, what, what happened? You know, why is this this way? You know? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, um, the biggest wave was then with the update, but then again, we tried to let people know that there's going to be a change. We didn't know how big, but obviously (laughs) we expected it. Uh, I mean, there, there are some clients that can still feel a bit of a shakeup, um, that are affected from, uh, it's probably the clients that didn't, have the budget to deploy everything that they were doing in a coordinate way. Uh, so for example, on more, more accounts and they were kind of like taking one and then the other, and they didn't have real time data on all platforms to readjust spend or budgets, but, um, and then they kind of had to with us to try to wing it until we get, got a glimpse of it. Uh, and really the essence but now everything seems to be much better i think uh, people got accustomed to the new world of marketing let's say and um, i i think it's all going well i mean obviously as you as you mentioned in terms of the facebook um sorry there is a bit of noise um one second that's okay okay so andre when you edit (laughs) please if you can cut out this uh, little bit here (laughs) <laughs> cool, because <laughs> oh, uh, we we'll, we'll have the video edited. Okay, so um, yeah, everything seems to be everything seems to get much better now. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to the Black Friday time and then Christmas. And I feel the platforms also try to, you know, they strip out these reporting elements and the algorithm is not great. But at the same time, um, I think they're doing their best to try to adapt. In the end, this is where they get the money from. Yeah, I mean, they have to, right? I mean, they, and I, I've heard and read that Facebook is feverishly working on a different way to, to track conversions that's going to be more future proof, you know, but we have, we have another layer of, of issue, um, you know, when I specifically on the, the recruitment side, because we fall into what's known as a special ad category. So mm-hmm. these special ad categories are obviously things like for the, those of your audience who don't know, th- when you're in a market like, for example, finance or uh, employment or just there's like three or four other things that, that go into the special ad category. Um, and I don't know if it's that way. I imagine it's that way overseas as well, but I know it's that way in yeah. the U.S. Yeah, so it is, it is. the idea being, you know, if I was going to put up a job to recruit somebody and I said, the only people that can apply are between the ages of. 15 to 30 that live in these neighborhoods that are these, this ethnicity, that would not fly, right? We'd be flagged as discrimination and rightfully yep. so. Um, so the government came out here and, and then Facebook made the change saying, you know, if you're recruiting, you have, you know, zero targeting and essentially 
you, you know, you can try to target to a profession, but not all professions are representative in Facebook's uh, options, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, sometimes you have to pick something close and then essentially you would let the cookie or let the tracking uh, go through the learning process and optimize the conversions based on that, right? So essentially in a special ad category, you're giving Facebook a jump start into the first level of this, but <laughs> then you have to wait and be patient and let Facebook work through the learning phase of optimizing conversions, you know, based on, on your performance. So the problem with this is, that Facebook's targeting sucks. <laughs> so it's not as good as it used to be. And the other problem is, is they're not transparent with any data, right? So you can't even tell what Facebook's doing in certain cases. Not enough to make when you're in a, like, for example, us being in a, in a, I give you a good example. One of our job sites is in nursing, right? So um, there's different types of nurses, RNs, LPNs. These are the difference between like the four-year degree nurses and the, the one or two-year degree nurses. They have very different skill sets. The demand is also much higher for the RNs, registered nurses. The, the, I would say the real nurses, but like the ones that, you know, are the more senior and the LPNs are the more junior. Well, when you're targeting nursing on Facebook, Facebook doesn't give you the targeting options to target based on that. It's all nurses. It's too broad mm -hmm. and too generic, but that's their only option. The only option they give you. All right. Yep. So, but the problem that we have, and we've been fighting Facebook on is that we are, um, you know, we're converting nurses, but they're, you know, LPNs and nurses aides, they're not like the, the regular, you know, high level nurses. Right. And there's, you know, we can do look like audiences. We've tried that, but Facebook still can't disseminate the difference between these types of nurses. They're having mm -hmm. a you know, real hard time with this. So one of the things we were looking at doing is actually, you know, we're saying, okay, Facebook, you're giving us zero transparency and you're getting us zero control and everything you're doing is tied to a conversion firing, right? To be able to, to match a conversion. So we're going to play that game. So we actually have started, um, for example, when somebody comes on our job site and, and, and fills out a job and they are an RN, for example, we actually send them to a, a different page as a thank you page. And we only put the conversion tracking on that page. So mm -hmm. now Facebook is only receiving, you know, signals back from that type so they can refine that algorithm. So even if someone would come in and convert and they weren't an, an RN, they wouldn't, it wouldn't, it would convert on our site, but it would not, it would be, a, you know, not a fraudulent click, but it wouldn't be a targeted click. It wouldn't be a targeted conversion. So we're starting to experiment a little bit with how to train Facebook's algorithm a little bit better within this employment category and within the lack mm -hmm. of remarketing and things like that to try and see if we can train the algorithm. And then again, mixing it up with different ad creatives, different mediums, um, there's different exposures and different uh, distribution networks applied to them. So testing is huge. Like I can't, you know, it, I'll, I'll have to let you know how it works, but <laughs> it's, uh, but this is crazy. We never had to do this two years ago. It was so much more simpler. Yeah, and also now you need far bigger budgets to execute something like what you just mentioned, yeah. rather than just, uh, you know, getting those uh, 50 conversions in uh, seven days or 30 days uh, yeah. with a, you know, like a relatively smaller budget, definitely smaller than uh, one yeah. required to, you know, uh, filter out the conversions and go through the journey that you mentioned just now. Yeah. And even just, you know, the seasonality and the, the changes, right? So we saw a lot of people swim to Google when Facebook had these issues. We saw a not a mass exodus from Facebook, but a lot of people hanging up Facebook for a little bit because they just weren't seeing the results and Google became more competitive once Facebook started getting a, a higher cost per acquisition, right? So we saw that attribute to the higher costs in the auction within Google, uh, therefore also translating to higher cost per leads, but sometimes still better than Facebook. So um, there's just a lot. So... I guess this goes to why you really need an agency, <laughs> you know, if you're, so if you're a startup company, right. And you're, you know, I speak to a lot of people all day that are like, I, I'm doing this myself. I'm doing well. And yeah, you may get conversions, but you don't know how, how well you're doing. I mean, we, we, we do a lot in recruitment, right? So we know what our, our campaigns produce at, and we work with uh, companies in the industry that are spending, you know, 15, 20 times the cost per acquisition that we get in the same channel. And they think they're doing fantastic. So it's, you know, we almost don't want to tell them what we're doing because it'll make them feel bad, but we, uh, you know, you, you have to have the experience and, and, it, and, you know, an agency like yourselves or us, I mean, um, you have, you just have to be in it all the time. You have to be in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Okay. So now since we, I, I'm really glad that we discussed all these issues because I think if we just, uh, you know, told people that you really need to be cautious, maybe it wouldn't uh, have weighted that much in the argument of why. So it's good that we maybe 
uh, brought these issues up front. And now if we were to think about a person that is trying to organize their marketing uh, efforts for the coming months, and maybe they don't have a large budget. And now to filter out even more, because you mentioned the split between uh, B2B and B2C. And I think, at least from what I see in the market, there's a lot of B2C tech platforms that have gain momentum from platforms to, you know, selling uh, Echo, Bio, groceries to, you know, you name it. It's pretty easy to launch a platform nowadays. Yeah. So, or, or, or an online store, because it's still a tech product. It's B2B, yeah. B, uh, B2C, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah let's, let's not even go there. But let's yeah. say, uh, you know, a software product uh, that is B2C. Yeah. Um, what would be your three points or uh, three pieces of advice that you'd give an entrepreneur or a marketing manager in a space yeah. like this uh, to look for when planning for next year? Yeah, so I would definitely, so I would kind of, I tend to look at things in buckets, uh, you know, because it's easier to, or for me, it's easier to organize them in my mind from a sense of strategy than it is to kind of put this in the one bucket of marketing, right? So mm-hmm. I will tend to look at things like, uh, you know, uh, long-term marketing, short-term marketing, and also new sales versus recurring sales, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, because they would have different strategies and different tactics and mediums, you know, long-term, uh, you know, you got to put SEO in play there. You can't really put SEO as a short-term. You'll see short-term gains, but it's really a long-term endeavor. It's, it's something, especially if you're in a really complicated niche, it's going to, it could take you years. And, and to be honest, a good SEO firm would tell you that uh, at some point it's not even worth it. You know, if you, you know, we have, we had somebody that came to us a couple of years ago and they wanted to rank number one for skincare. And that was their, their, pet, you know, pet term. And, and it doesn't matter what budget they come to the table with, they're not going to do it. You know, not, not within a couple of years. I mean, they're 10 years behind, you know, the biggest companies and billionaire brands, uh, you know, have been doing that. There's just, there's, you know, so we tried to get them to, to focus on some more meaty middle uh, type of keywords, some long tail keywords to social some short gains with, we call it like a vanity metric where a vanity metric for us is when the owner of the company just wants to tell his friends that he ranks for skincare, but doesn't really care how much it costs to get in there or what business impact it has. So, mm-hmm. you know, we ended up not being a good fit because we're just not going to lie to anybody, but you know, SEO is a great uh, long-term in- instructor. You got to be in it for the long term. You got to go with the, the, the algorithm updates and the changes under that. You're going to be producing a lot of content and not online PR that you can also recycle into your social campaigns. Um, you know, Pay-per-click, paid social, I love as a short term. I also mm-hmm. like to do it before I do SEO. I like to do paid search and social first, specifically paid search, because I get to real-time uh, kind of uh, real-time, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Validate. Yeah, real-time data, but real-time validation on my keywords, my ad copy, my click-through rates. So I can actually start experimenting with things like, like a click-through rate, right, on an ad. I could have several ads targeted and I can find out which ones produce better. Well, guess what? Those become my meta tag or get my meta and title tags on my website when I do my SEO because I've mm-hmm. proven that I can optimize that, that language for SEO keywords, but I've now done real-time experimenting to find which one has a better click-through rate. Again, mm-hmm. SEOs and internet marketers, sometimes they focus so much on the shiny things in front of them that they forget to look at all of it, right? So what's if I rank for number one on whatever term, right? I'm getting in, I'm shown in front of millions of searches but my click-through rate is half of what it could be. I'm losing half the amount of traffic. And, mm-hmm. and that, you know, 1% click-through rate to a 2% click-through rate on a, on a head term that brings in hundreds of thousands of clicks, that's a lot. That could result in millions of dollars worth of sales. So from an SEO perspective, taking it full stack and full funnel, I'm really, you know, going from there, using paid search and social, I'm really experimenting there. I tend to bring content marketing at this point as well because I need it for SEO. I need it for paid search and social. And I'll typically try to, to produce a content calendar with, that mirrors all of them together so that they're mm-hmm. all kind of talking about the same thing. It's not kind of a, a schizophrenic type of like content strategy where it doesn't make sense together, right? And they should all be pushing kind of what your goals are for that, that time frame. So search social PPC, definitely rolling out with those. Um, and I would say also, um, you know, a lot of uh, people, their startups are so focused on getting the sale. They sometimes, again, shiny object, they forget to focus on, you know, keeping the sale, upselling mm-hmm. the sale, referring other people from the sale. So having things like, re, you know, retargeting, uh, good account-based marketing where you're going out and using things like email or social, um, you know, retargeting throughout the social networks to get people to upgrade, upsell, keep them going and things like that. Um, cross-sell amongst other products, you know, uh, things they left in the cart, that kind of thing, if you're talking e-commerce. Uh, mm-hmm. So those are the things I would really work on. For starting up, 
you know, content SEO, PPC and retargeting, things like that. I mean, those are my go-tos um, for those. Love it. Super cool. And also uh, two things that I would uh, mention and you can, uh, you know, you can argue with them if you feel sure. like uh, you yeah, don't agree. Uh, one of them would be there's nothing wrong with, uh, because we saw people that tend to see Google ads, for example, and SEO as not complementary, but rather having to choose from from the two, one is nothing wrong with, actually it's good to have the two done in parallel because one serves, as you mentioned, in terms of buckets, the short-term goals and the information and data gathering, while as the other one is a medium to long-term activity. So you can, and you probably should uh, do both in parallel. They also, yeah, they also uh, kind of saturate that first page of Google, right? Now you're taking up double the amount of spaces, you're pushing competitors down. And we know the click distribution from the top of the Google search results to the bottom, right? We know that, you know, once you get past page, for, you know, you know, position five, six, seven, eight, nine, so to speak, you know, it, it shrinks, right? So if you can get top positioning and a PPC positioning, you're really capitalizing on a lot. But I would also just throw in the SEO stuff too. You know, there's a lot more now than just ranking, right? We got feature snippets, rich snippets. We have ads, we have, you know, videos, we have rich media, universal search. We have so many different ways to show up in Google right now. So SEO is kind of turned from this, like, we just want to rank number one. And I keep telling clients like, that's, you know, what way? And not only that, but you have personalization, right? So I would say you want to rank number one in whose search results, like, you know, everything is so personalized right now. So, you know, we tend to look at things like page metrics over ranking and vanity metrics, just because it's a better conversation framing to have. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's more in line with goals. Mm -hmm. But I can't help it. Everybody still wants to talk about rankings. You know, it's, you know it'll never go away. Time will come. Time will come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the second one was uh, with content marketing. Uh, yeah. Very um, on point to what you mentioned. And uh, the way that I feel about it is that because we can't really plan long term, um, what we tend to advise is to ha have an integrated content plan. But rather than having it for the full year, let's say for the full of 2022, rather try to focus on quarters maybe and then monthly yeah. plans, right? I mean, do you agree yeah. with this? Absolutely. Because, you know, with especially with doing that, you allow you, if, if you've planned too long, again, especially in COVID right now, the market's shifting so much, you need to allow your time that time for flexibility, but also being kind of uh, nimble and, and agile allows you to take advantage of opportunities. It's like a tactic called newsjacking, right? Newsjacking for us is, you know, if we find something in the news that we can bring our client's product to and take advantage of those searches, that's something we can spin together really quickly. So keeping it short like that allows you to, you know, as they say here, roll with the punches. <laughs> mm -hmm. <You> know? <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Oliver, this was great to have you here on the show. Really, really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, me too. Um, Tell us uh, where can people find you or how could yeah. people find support with you or with your companies? Yeah, so um, right now you can check out our, our agency offering, which is a trustedsearchmarketing.com. That's trustedsearchmarketing.com. Uh, you can check out our other portfolio brands over at track5, that's T-R-A-C-K-F-I-V-E.com. And uh, Oliver Feekins, you can find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to LinkedIn with me, shoot me in information or any questions you have, be happy to answer them, so yeah. That's it. <laughs> Super. Love it. <laughs> awesome. Oliver, again, thank you so much. This was a very, very nice conversation. Looking forward to you guys tuning in today, uh, hearing your thoughts, comments, um, share your insights if you have any, or if you agree or not with us, uh, let us know what, uh, what are your thoughts. All of them are welcome. And uh, as always, if you have any ideas or things that you'd like us to focus on, maybe even together uh, in a future episode, let us know. You can email us at hello at marketu.com uh, or just post in the comments uh, uh, on YouTube, if you watch this on YouTube or otherwise, um, you know, any way possible, you can uh, LinkedIn me, LinkedIn with uh, Oliver, and maybe uh, we can sort something out uh, to sure. serve better your needs. Until then, right. best of luck with everything. Oliver, thank you so much again for being on the show. My and pleasure. I look thank forward you so much. I look forward to hopefully meet you in person someday uh, in America or the UK. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> One there you of the go. Two. Maybe we'll see you. What, have you ever been? Uh, do you get to come to the SEO conferences over here at all? I guess now they're shut down, but. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I haven't had a chance yet. Uh, I was planning, prob I mean, <laughs> previously I was planning for yeah. this year, but now I think it probably will be next year. Uh, I saw America is now open, so hopefully we, yeah. it'll stay like that. Yeah, they're starting to bring conferences back. So slowly, but um, but yeah, but there's some, there's some good ones like like traffic and conversion conference. There's obviously like SMX, SES, 
Uh, the Moz conferences are great. I mean, there's we've got some fantastic um, some offerings over here. So definitely, anyone who's interested, check them out. I mean, there's you know try to find one in Las Vegas. You know, that's a fun place to go. So uh, know, yes, there's no. always one. <laughs> yeah, that's my recommendation. <laughs> you may not go to the conference, but you'll have fun. You know, so <laughs> you, you just have the ticket. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> great. Cool. Thank you so much, Oliver. Have an right, awesome day. It. And you guys as well for tuning in today. See you on the next episode. See ya.